Hello everyone and welcome to another edition of Educators, Performers, Creators Show, edition number 15, sweet 15, oh wait, no, quinceanera, anyway, I have a few ladies here with me, wonderful top TPRS and Comprehensible Input Educators who are going to give us a preview of what's going to happen at a conference here in St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, this is the EPC show, a platform for anyone, for any educators, performers, or creators who want to uh, show what they do, who are passionate about what they do and want to show it with the world. If you are interested in being a guest with me, please contact me at mail at paulinobrenner.com. But you can find me anywhere on Twitter, Google+, no matter where you'll get to me, uh, to share your stuff, like the, the latest are going to share today. This is live, it's also, also going to be recorded. Please join us, join the conversation, post your question. If you are on the Google Plus event, leave a comment. If you are watching on YouTube, leave a comment. Or you can tweet using the EPC show hashtag, and we'll do our best to answer them live. Today I'm going to take a, a sit back, a step back, and let the ladies run the show. Here they are. They're going to introduce themselves as well. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you, Paulino. Carol. All right. Thanks, Paulino. And, and thank you, Martina, Christy, and Carrie, for, for agreeing to be on the show and, and for agreeing to share ahead of time some of your jewels that you'll be sharing at IFLT in July. Um, in St. Paul, and so um, I look forward to learning myself. So I'm going to start with Martina Bex, and uh, Martina will have various sessions, as will Christine Carey, and Martina's going to share with you um, some tidbits from her authentic resource um, session that she'll be doing at IFLT. So Martina, take it away. Hi. So, um, yeah, I'm going to talk just briefly about uh, authentic resources, and um, I'm not going to really touch on their importance today because I think that there's a lot of um, information out there that's pretty easy to find from Actful on um, how uh, or on why they're so important to use in class. Um, if we could just look at that first slide, Paulino, um, the, uh, our research shows us that um, here are 10 research-based reasons. You can look through this later once it's on YouTube. You can pause the screen if you need to. But from my own experience, um, my students are so motivated by authentic resources. They think it's so cool that um, they're able to uh, work with something that real people in from the target culture would be looking at and would be interpreting, trying to find um, use for information. Um, but when you look through these 10 reasons, I would say that my summarizing thought would be that authentic resources are important for us to use in our language classes um, because they can make students more fluent and they can give them new perspectives. And I would say, change that just a little bit and say, I guess, that authentic resources are important when they make students more fluent and give them new perspectives because our time with our students is so limited. And so um, I don't want to spend time in my class doing an activity with my students that I could send them home with. Um, my class time, I want to spend that pumping them full of comprehensible input. So um, whenever I use an authentic resource in my classes, um, I go through just a really quick three-step process. I introduce it to my students with an activity. They interact with the resource. Oh, sorry, Pauline, um, with the, the Comprehensify It slide. Um, to make it comprehensible, we, I introduce it with an activity, students interact with it in some way, and then we investigate the themes a little bit th further. So next, um, I'm just going to show you a quick authentic resource today from, it's actually uh, like a furniture um, sales store, um, and they sell like office furniture, so they had this um, cell phone addiction infograph. And I'm going to show you really quickly how you could introduce it with a parallel story. You could use um, a Q&A mix and match activity that I learned from uh, Sharon Birch's blog and then uh, investigate it with discussion. So um, to introduce it, um, if you are, next slide, if you're familiar with um, storytelling at all, um, story asking, I guess, with TPRS, I wrote this little story script that um, goes along with uh, 
the infographic kind of introduces the key vocabulary and the themes. Um, it's about a boy who's addicted to his cell phone. Um, he has a lot of problems. His mom uh, scolds him for being addicted to his phone and tells him, you've got to give up your phone for a week. Because in this infograph, it talks about, well, whether people would rather give up their phone for a week or something else like chocolate or alcohol. Um, and so John's like, no, I can't give up my, my phone. I'll give up something else. And his mom's like, no, you can't. So finally he's like, okay, well, if I give up my phone for a week, then you have to give up looking at Channing Tatum or something for a week. So um, if you don't know how to use story scripts, I put the link on that slide so that you can um, visit that later. Once this is on YouTube, um, you can just look at that link, um, click on it, and see how you might use this. But that, but that story, asking that in class, I would have student actors, and um, it would solidify the target vocabulary in there, things like addicted to a cell phone and giving up a phone, because that would be new vocabulary for a lower level student. Um, and then the next slide, that, oh, you're already on it, sorry, Paulino. Um, the Q&A mix and match activity, this is when students would actually interact with um, with the authentic resource. So this would be when they would see it for the first time. And so I would give them a copy of the infograph. I would give them some questions in the target language. All of this is on English, is in English right now, but it would be in the target language. And um, students would just have to read the questions and find the answer in the answer bank um, based on the in infograph. So I've matched the task to my students' level. Um, the language is comprehensible for them and they're able to be successful with this activity. And then after we do an interaction activity with the authentic resource, um, I would move on to the investigation phase because um, I say if it's worth doing something in your class, then it's worth discussing it. So if I'm going to, any resource that I pull into my class, it has to be something that I can, that is engaging enough that my students would want to talk about whatever it's about. So in this case, cell phone addiction. Um, are, so questions like, are you addicted to your cell phone? What problems do people have that are addicted to their cell phones? What do you do most with your cell phone? Would you prefer to give up um, X or would you prefer to give up your cell phone for a week? Um, is it necessary to have a smartphone in general? Is it necessary to have a smartphone if you're a child, if you're a teenager, if you're an adult? So in this way, um, I'm connecting my students to the content of the infograph and um, they have a chance to uh, think about it in the, in the same way that someone in the target culture might, you know, if someone in the target culture is reading this, um, looking at this infograph, they're going to be considering these same ideas. So my students get a chance to um, kind of be place themselves in their shoes. So with that three-step process, um, introducing it with some kind of an activity that prepares students with the um, vocabulary and with the themes, they interact with it in a way that um, allows them to be successful, that they feel like, oh my word, I just interpreted, you know, this text, I just answered questions, and I don't understand half the words on there, but I was able to do this, and I'm so awesome, and then investigating it where we get more language um, practice and really dig into those themes. So um, that's the general three-step thing. There's a, it'll be a l much longer workshop at IFLT, and um, I would love to see you there. Great, thanks, Martina. Um, that's uh, some some great info that you shared. I have a question for you, just in regard to your questions and and all the activities. Um, I just want to verify that when you're talking about doing those activities, you're doing them in the target language. Am I right? Yes, yes. The whole thing, all three steps would be in the target language because um, I think, again, that just class time is so valuable that I don't want to waste time trying to prepare right. my students to do something in English when I could spend that time preparing them and also building their fluency. So you just translated all those slides and questions into English so that the people who were listening to your presentation would understand what they were. Yes. Thank okay. you for clarifying that, Carol. Yeah. Great. And Martina, um, I also have another question from a viewer, Rebecca Moulton. Thank you for sending your question. Hi, she Rebecca. Says, <laughs> there you are. Martina mentioned students wo do work at home. What types of assignments do, do you have students do, time worth it, and valid, etc.? 
Um, well, honestly, when I, um, I'm not in the classroom full time right now, I'm home with my kids, but um, when I was, I didn't have my students do any work at home um, just because of the situation that I was in. I was in a um, really poor um, district and most of my kids didn't have any kind of um, computer access at home. A lot of my students were um, homeless and so even taking an assignment home um, to complete and bring back the next day was a pretty hard thing to expect across the board so I didn't do a lot of that. I really like um, the real world homework that um, Sarah Elizabeth Cottrell does um, from on the Music Rentos blog. I think that she does has some neat stuff on there but I didn't really expect my students to do work at home. Great. Great, and we have um, s someone making a comment on uh, some of your ideas. His uh, Cadena Sensei, John Cadena, says, "Love the idea of using storytelling to pre-teach key vocab for authentic uh, resources." Mm -hmm. Thank you, Martina, and mm -hmm. thank you, John, for your question. I'm gonna give also a shout out to someone. Luz, who says, I'm so happy to learn from all of you. That's great. So, Luz, thank you for being with us. And we are learning from all these wonderful ladies. Keep your questions coming. Remember to post on YouTube, Google+, Plus, or EP, the hashtag EPC Show on Twitter. L Carol, who's next? Sorry, it takes a minute to unmute. We're going to hear from Christy. And Christy is going to share um, some tidbits on how she teaches with novels. So I can't wait to learn from Christy. If you're wondering why I keep looking over on the other side, I'm taking notes too. I'm learning right along with the rest of you. So Christy, take it away. Thanks, Carol. Hi, everybody. So one of the things that I have been doing for years and years is using novels in my classroom. And I really think that um, not only are they a great source of comprehensible input for students, but if you are just kind of dipping your toe in the water of teaching with comprehensible input, I think novels are a great way to get started because it kind of takes the pressure off the teacher. I think a lot of times um, the idea of, of doing storytelling can be a little bit overwhelming because it's kind of a lot of on the spot, thinking on your feet, being creative, and that can be really scary. Um, especially when you first get started. So I think novels are a really good way to just sort of dip your toe in the water and get started with that. Um, so I am going to just be um, talking a little bit about the basics of using novels in your classroom. And um, at IFLT, I'm going to be presenting, presenting a couple of different sessions um, related to reading. I'm going to be presenting about the basics of teaching with novels, and I'm also going to be presenting about how to use readers theater in your classroom. So I'll just touch on both of those items um, real quickly tonight. Um, so the first thing you need to do is you need to decide what novels you want to bring into your classroom. And um, I know there are teachers right now who are having great success having students self-select the novels that they read. And um, what I do personally is I do not a novel with the entire class. So um, both can be very successful. It's a personal preference type of thing. Um, and you can try a little bit of each and see what works well for you. Um, what I really love about novels is they're really rich in culture. So, um, and I know Carrie's going to talk quite a bit about this, so I don't want to step on her presentation. But um, when you look at a novel that you're considering, is there culture in it? Is there potential to expand? into a full unit. Um, and even if the novel that you're choosing to read isn't super culturally based, um, it's a good opportunity to take the novel that you're reading and compare what's going on in the novel to things that are going on in the target culture. So even if it's not a really culturally rich novel, you can still make connections to the target culture. Um, what I think is really important when you're selecting novels is find a novel that has a compelling story. and um, that's going to vary depending on who your students are. So from year to year, you may find that a novel might work better for some groups than others. And um, you know, be prepared to get to know your students and find out what kind of novel is going to resonate, resonate with them. Um, another thing that I personally like to consider is um, I like to find a novel that has enough action that um, we can do reader's theater in the class. I think that that just makes it so much more compelling to get students all dressed up and use props and act out 
action scenes especially or cheesy love scenes or anything that anything that you can really be kind of melodramatic about is really fun for readers theater um, now once you have your novel selected um, you need to I know it seems like I'm stating the obvious but you need to figure out how you're going to read the novel with your students um, I remember when I was in high school and whenever we would read we would just read aloud in the target language and I remember not understanding a whole lot of what I was actually reading. I could pronounce it. Um, you know, my teacher was happy with me, but I really wasn't understanding what I was reading. It's so important that we make sure that what we're presenting to our students is comprehensible, whether it be spoken language or written language. They, if they're not comprehending it, they're not acquiring the language. So you need to select something that is going to be fairly comprehensible to the students um, or you need to be prepared to make it comprehensible for them. Um, one way that you can make a novel more comprehensible is you can translate the entire chapter to students. Um, and I kind of prefer the word decode because a lot of times when we say translate, we think about grammar translation. That's not what I'm talking about at all. I'm talking about just decoding the meaning. Um, I like to get beyond this phase really quickly. When they're in early level one, we might do more um, decoding word by word. I like to move beyond that as quickly as possible. Um, where I tend to move toward as quick as I can is just reading in the target language and then translating the parts that they're struggling with. So, and then once we, once I have identified parts that are a little tougher for them, um, I like to move immediately into discussion. Like Martina was saying, if it's worth teaching, it's worth discussing. Um, so bring whatever's in that novel immediately into a class discussion and start relating it to the students. Um, just talking about characters, no matter how compelling the book is, it's going to be more interesting if the students are able to make com comparisons with their own lives and things that are important to them. Christy, that's such a great point. And, um, and I, really, um, I really love what you said about um, it's really not translation. Mm -hmm. um, because when we take when we take language courses in school, do we take translation courses or do we take the language courses first? We take well, language, right? Because you can't translate until you actually know the language, and so yeah. people people often get disturbed by that term translation. So mm -hmm. I'm to the point now where I try to not even say it at all because it is misunderstood, mm -hmm. and it's just it's just like um, Christy said. It's that we're linking meaning. We are not translating word for word. In the beginning, maybe the first week of school, if we have a sentence, we read it in the target language and then maybe we'll repeat it or we'll spot check or do comprehension checks to make sure they understand every word. But um, it is just as Christy said, the more skills they develop, the less we link meaning. So as their knowledge in the language grows, we are speaking less and less and less in our first language as, as their comprehension increases. So I'm and so I would just like to that. point out too that um, we all, we've all heard that ACTFL recommends that we speak the target language or use the target language 90% or more in our classes. Yeah. I would just challenge everyone to be um, careful with how you use that 10% in the native language, um, you, can, yes. you can utilize that 10% to increase their comprehension. So if you're judicious with your use of the native language, um, you're going to be aiding their comprehension. You don't want to waste that 10%. Right. Good point. Touche. <laughs> so um, that was about all I had to say. Um, the, the last thing I'll just touch on really quickly is once you've done the reading, it's really important to then go back and do some kind of supplemental activities. I think the best and easiest way to supplement reading is by having discussions, just having discussions as a class, comparing our own lives to the lives of the characters in the books, um, creating little comics or doodles. I think creating art is a really great way to make connections with things that we're reading. Um, readers theater, whenever you can bring something to life and have actors acting it out, it's going to just be cemented in their memory. Um, another activity that Carol talks about all the time is freeze frame, where you have actors come up, 
and just freeze in a scene and then the teacher can talk about that scene with the class. So you have that conversation going but you have the visual at the same time. So it's just so important to not just do the reading but do follow up supplemental activities as well. And I have to put a plug in for um, Christy's uh, blog this week. I don't know if anybody was on Twitter and saw that she was talking about her Frida Kahlo, um, Frida Kahlo selfies. And um, if you know anything about Frida, um, and I don't know a lot, everything I know I learned from Christy basically, <laughs> um, but she was really into um, you know, self-portraits. And after Christy kind of got me hooked, I started reading more about her and I just found it really fascinating. And um, this, this last week uh, I was in the Dominican and uh, we were actually teaching literacy classes and we were having um, students read in Spanish. Okay, we're not talking foreign language, but we were having them just learn in Spanish um, about um, Van Gogh and um, and Christy it's so it just resonated with me when you said it's so important to teach them about art because especially my students come with very limited educational backgrounds and so it was so intriguing I um, uh, they had a picture one of the self portraits by Van Gogh where he's you know cut off his ear and you know that that particular one and that got me into Frida Kahlo and it got me into the whole selfies and everything so if you have not read Christie's blog this week you need to go in and you need to look at her Frida Kahlo selfie activity it's awesome and um, I, I borrowed it this week and my guys were so fascinated and um, it's so interesting that you know I don't know very much about art at all I'll be the first to say I'm ignorant but th my guys are so fascinated every time I teach them about anything they think I'm like a genius. So um, it's a good thing that Christy's teaching her students because they probably wouldn't have the same opinion of me. So, um, so anyway, check out her blog. It's awesome. Thanks, Carol. Yeah. Sorry, muted myself too fast. Carrie Toth, the uh, Central States Teacher of the Year, 2015 or 14? Which was it? 14. Okay. 14. She's going to share with you some ideas for backward planning, whether it's backward planning from a novel or, or for from whatever piece it is. Um, and she's got some great info to share. And you are on, Carrie. Thank you, Carol Gobb and Paulino and my friend. I think that part of what scares people about TPRS and teaching with comprehensible input is just this overwhelming fear of how do I plan my lessons then and we talk about movie talks and we talk about using novels and authentic resources and it gets to be all these balls you're trying to juggle in the air and so I think understanding by design or backward planning is a good way to get a handle on all of the things you're trying to juggle to really get input into your students that's going to come out later as output because a misconception about TPRS and TCI is that we don't output and that's not true we don't force output which means we don't ask them to output things they don't know we ask them to output the things that they've learned so how do I move their acquisition forward how do I get them to a place that they can really do good output um, backward planning is kind of a big heavy topic and so we're just going to look at a couple little parts um, first, you have to decide before anything. The reason it's called backward planning is because you're starting at the end. Um, you start at the back and you think, how am I going to assess this, this unit? Once you find that selfie uh, idea from Frida Kahlo, or once you find the cell phone infographic, or once you find a piece of content or a novel, an authentic resource you like, normally we would think, okay, what else can I bring into this unit? How can I teach them? And at the end, we look at all of the things that we've taught and we decide how we're going to assess. But backward planning would really encourage you to do the opposite, to take this piece that you like and try and figure out how you could assess your students on that one piece. So if you see the background of the slide there, that's the novel cover for the novel Bianca Nieves y los Siete Toritos, uh, Bianca Nieves and the Seven Bulls. And this book has got a bullfighting twist. So as I'm thinking about my assessments, I could tell you all of them. I'm only going to look at one. I'm thinking formative and summative assessments all the way through. So I have to decide what proficiency looks like in my mind because a student can only do what I ask them to do if I've made it really clear to them what that proficient goal looks like. And, and I'd like to also encourage you to step away from that traditional idea of comprehension questions that say, did this happen in the chapter? 
to a really a more performance-based assessment. So the one that I've included is um, Spanish fans. In the novel, the main character loses her Spanish fan. And so uh, in a twist on that idea at my school, we've used this. Um, Paulino, can you switch to the next slide for me? We've used this idea as a formative assessment. And they take a piece of paper and they fold up their little Spanish fan. And then they draw the picture of one of the characters from the novel. And they put little resources around. Oh, goodness, some of the slides didn't show up, darn it. Um, they put little resources around that show character traits of this main character. And then they give an oral presentation. So this would be later in the novel after they have some good knowledge and good background information about the characters. But it's going to give me a little bit of an assessment that lets them output the language that I've input into them. And to hey, meet Karen. proficiency. Sorry. What? Um, if you're missing a little visual, maybe can you drop us a URL to your blog so that we could maybe look to see what the little fan looks like? Is it on your I blog? It isn't. But um. you'll put it on. <laughs> I will put it on after the show. And it makes me sad because the next slide after that, I was going to show you my next uh, idea is that um, besides assessment, we have to, oh, it's here. Good. That one's here. How will you hook them? Oh, there it is. Right there. That's it. Right there. Super. Uh, so this is our fan. Um, the main character is Bianca, but she has a wicked stepmother named Salome. And uh, so this student chose Salome, and she put little items all around her Spanish fan. And when she did her presentation, she was talking about identity. And that's kind of one of our keys in presentations in my Spanish classes is that we're looking deeper than just, I'm tall, I'm short, I'm nice, I'm mean. And we're looking at what identity really means. And so she's talking about real character things. Like they had learned, they wanted to learn the word gold digger. So if you look, the little dollar sign is up there. Um, and so we teach, funny, they can learn words that really attract them. Um, to start every unit, though, whatever kind of resource you're using, I would encourage you, as you're backward planning, think about what you're going to do to assess. And then think about how you're going to get the students to be passionate about this unit. because. That's what sells students on your storytelling. That's what sells students on the way that you present material in class. It's what sells students on authentic resources and novels. When they see that you're excited about it and you're into it, they get deep into it. And so this is, um, this is courtesy of my daughter. This year my daughter played the evil queen in Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And this was her outfit. And I'd like for you to look at that attractive nose there and gray hair. I, I took that from her and I have it now in my prop box in my classroom and I know that before the show we had a question about where do you keep your props and so because it fits well right here I'll go ahead and say that I have a really great tall plastic drawer set that I got at Walmart and I have things in all the different drawers and I tend to know after you've um, told a few stories you start to recognize what things you pull out together so all of my cell phones and my mustache with the little glasses is in the same drawer because often somebody creepy is calling somebody so I have to pull those out together so your organization may be like that. But this is my daughter's outfit as the Evil Queen. So next year my hook for this novel is that I'm going to come dressed as her and they are going to interview an evil stepmother and they're going to ask her questions and they're going to find out some character traits and then we're going to use her throughout the reading of the novel. We're going to use her as an example to make comparison to the mother in this uh, novel that we're reading. So we can always go back and have that parallel character and have that parallel connection. And you can find out all kinds of other things if you come to our sessions at IFLT. Don't miss them. Great. Hey, that's awesome. I love that, Carrie Toth. Um, I, sometimes I listen to you and you have such great ideas and I think, oh, I wish I could do that, but um, I'm just not in the same setting that I can do the same things that you all do. I do borrow you know, tidbits here and there, but I'm sort of in a unique position and so um, what I teach is really different. What my preference is, honestly, that I would just teach high-frequency vocabulary and that I would do it however I wanted to. 
Um, but that isn't my reality. It used to kind of be my reality. It is no longer my reality. Um, I have to teach a lot of baseball vocabulary. Um, and, and baseball vocabulary that doesn't always have a lot of meaning to me. Uh, for example, um, I just will show you. These were the notes that a coach gave me uh, just last week. Um, I was supposed to work with them on bunting strategy. And this is the piece of paper he gave me. Uh, this would be play number one, as you could see, indicated they're upside down. This is play number three, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, that's for real. That's what I'm supposed to teach. And so that's kind of a trick. And it doesn't always really require high-frequency vocabulary, although we did muddle through, and we actually did pretty well. So what I really want you to think about is teaching content and what content is going to help your students the most. So for, for my students, obviously we know baseball vocabulary will help them. But honestly, it will help them professionally, but I still really need to cater to them emotionally and socially, so I have to teach them a lot more. Um, it's, it's, I, I honestly wish I only had to teach to the actual or national standards because it would honestly be a whole lot easier. Um, anyway, what you teach is really dependent on, on the students in front of you. All the content is, is relative to who you're teaching. So Paulino, if you scroll to the next slide, there you go. This is actually just from last week. I just got back from the Dominican actually yesterday. So if I look a little, little bit tired, it's with good reason. Um, we were um, working on all sorts of um, vocabulary that was relevant to them in their particular situations. And so um, at this particular point, we were talking about uh, getting a good jump. And they talk about getting a jump on your lead, which makes no sense in Spanish because they don't say get a good jump on it. Um, it doesn't have the same context, and so we were working on, um, you know, the strange content of baseball vocabulary and, and just the game itself. But um, all the different kinds of vocabulary and, and the different topics and things that I have to teach them truly are all content related. Um, this, just in the last two months, I've been teaching about baseball. I've been teaching about body parts and health. Um, money and conversion and making change and mathematics and addition and subtraction. Many of them can't add or subtract or don't really quite understand when to apply addition or subtraction or multiplication. Um, you, we were working on multiplication this last week um, and they still fall back on adding, you know, 72 five times instead of multiplying it. So uh, I'm working on lots of different kinds of content. Many of them will be traveling to the United States within the next few months, so we have to work on travel and 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 different terms that are associated with travel vocabulary. And 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 really, among all of this, I'm embedding high frequency vocabulary as I'm trying to teach them um, how to function in the world in every possible setting that they could possibly throw at me. So. Um, in terms of content, what kind of platforms do I use and, and what kinds of, of tools do I use to teach it? I, I'm going to tell you that I don't have an end to my list. All the things that you see listed there are things that I've done um, just this year. So if you were at the OFLA conference or Central States conference and you were with Carrie Toth and me um, in our content instruction or our content-based comprehensible input um, session, um, I'll just tell you that when we are at IFLT, Carrie and I will be doing an enhanced session and we are going to share with you specific uh, content that we teach we're going to tell you exactly how to teach it so that if you really liked it, you could actually imitate exactly what we did and you'll have your whole unit done. So, um, and we, I, can I butt in, Carol? Please and butt the in. Great, <laughs> and the great part of it is that we teach such different students that you really have no matter what kind of a clientele you have in your classroom, between what Carol teaches and what I teach, you probably will find something that really hits the nail for you. Right. Um, I teach uh, students with limited educational backgrounds, lim limited literacy. Some of them are better educated, and obviously we can cover more ground. And 
you know, Carrie's kind of a rocket scientist, and, you know, she's like the biology major and the super smart person, and so she has to teach students that are a little higher level than mine. That's okay. But uh, go back once, Paulino, for me. Back up a little bit. I just want to show you. This is, no, no, one forward. Look at, no, you're going the wrong way. Right there. Uh, you nope, you jumped ahead again. <laughs> Right there, stop. That's good, thanks. So I just, if you follow baseball at all and you saw John Lester pitching and you saw the ball get stuck in his glove, I'm going to tell you that this one video helped me teach literally about a dozen baseball terms um, from pitching and crossing the plate and watching the runner and, and um, you know, looking at second, all the things you have to do for a play in baseball. The, the long and the short of the video was that the ball got stuck in his glove and he couldn't get the lead runner out. And so he actually took off his glove, ran toward first base, and chucked his glove with the ball stuck inside and got the runner out. That's the first photo. Last year, I compared it to last year, I showed him this little video. You see where the ball got stuck in his jersey. And so what happens when the ball gets stuck in your jersey is the ball's actually out of play and they stop the runner. So uh, interesting things about baseball. Look at the old black and white photo, and that's polio. There's a huge emphasis that I now need to teach every body part known to man, or that is on anyone's body or could possibly be missing from a body. And so um, I decided I was going to teach them about polio. And um, it was really interesting. I showed them pictures of polio, and there was this one picture of, of – this boy with polio, and he had a very unique physique and a unique way of standing, and my students saw that, and they said, oh, teacher, we saw that guy. We saw that guy on the beach. I took the photo from the Internet, but I kid you not, I saw the same man on the beach in Boca Chica, Dominican Republic, and they all thought it was him. And so we all had this revelation that we had always wondered what was wrong with that man, and we all learned together that that man actually had polio. And then another boy went on to say, teacher, my father had polio. And now one leg is really small and he has a lot. There are so many things that you can teach. And I didn't teach them every aspect of the disease. But I'm telling you, if you look at that list, use all of those things to help teach whatever content you want to. If it's from ordering a pizza to polio to sports to whatever it is, there's so much you can teach. This is just from last week. Um, I had to teach uh, some coaches some English and baseball. We followed up on, uh, on the Lester video. I showed them the Lester video. We did movie talk with that video. Um, the coaches were just beside themselves. They were so excited because they, it was like one of the first times they actually came away able to say something. And so I did a follow-up. So what you see on the screen there is just from a couple days ago, I did a photo peach quiz. If you don't know photo peach, it's just photopeach.com. And, um, and it's, it's so simple to, to put up. And I, I do a lot of Kahoot. The advantage for me for this photo peach is that where I teach in the Dominican, I don't have Internet. I don't have Wi-Fi, so I can't use Kahoot. The same thing with Kahoot is you can't stop. The, the video. You can't stop the quiz from going in front of your eyes. You have to keep, you know, keep going. And my students a lot of times don't read that well, and I have to help them read. So with Photo Peach, I download it as a movie, and we can start and stop. It makes it a whole lot easier. And you can teach any kind of content and build your content. And I would say that the biggest thing is just what Christy said. The biggest stumbling block, I think, for people to make this transition is they just don't know where to start. Um, there's just too much in front of your face. You just don't even know where to start. So I would tell you, start with a novel. I, I teach with novels, but I, I wasn't going to go into that because Christy and, and Carrie already talked about it. But I'll tell you that on this week, we're going to be starting the Felipe Alo novel. And uh, we'll teach... Um, We'll teach civil rights. We'll teach about discrimination across the world. We'll teach about um, just, you know, historical events of baseball. We'll learn so much just backward planning from a novel. A novel gives you a nice framework so you don't feel kind of like you're spiraling out of control. So just know that with the Internet, with technology, you have an unlimited number of options. So just keep your eyes and your ears open. If you start with something fixed, let's just say you start with a novel, 
that novel, if you follow some of the tips from, from Carrie about backward planning, and uh, you follow some of the tips from Martina for, okay, how can we incorporate some authentic resources into this semi-authentic text, um, and, and follow Christie's advice of just, you know, how you read and, and how we can wrap it all into one big package for this culturally rich unit um, that is content-based as well. And just, you know, it's that useless, I always tell my students, it's useless trivia that we love to learn. Some of it's useless, some of it's not, but I don't know anybody that does not love to learn. Sometimes students just don't realize they love it until you help them do it. So anybody have any questions? Carrie, Christy, Martina, questions? Anybody have any questions sent in? Paulino? Carol, do you want to talk about IFLT just a minute before we go to the questions? Uh, sure, sure. Um, so IFLT stands for the International Forum on Language Teaching. And we will have about 25 presenters and coaches there who will be there sharing their ideas, their best practices, sharing you know, what they do in the classroom. The, um, I would say that the beauty of, of this conference is that you're talking to real teachers. All of us teach. All of us are in the trenches. All of us have the same struggles. Um, I'm not saying all of our struggles are ident identical, but we all have the same hurdles in terms of, you know, there, there is a lot that sometimes we have to wade through to get to be able to teach our students so they can actually develop fluency. And so you'll learn from some of the best at the IFLT conference. You can watch live language classes in session. You'll watch um, various Spanish class classes, French and Mandarin. You pick the class you want to observe. You watch a master teacher deliver their, their CI-based lesson in front of teachers and students alike. And then you'll see, um, you'll, you'll see them in action. And, and then you'll learn how to implement them yourselves in various sessions and workshops. So we hope to see you there. Great, and the link gets posted in the Google Plus event and will also Great. be available in the description of this video. We do have a few more minutes for some questions. We'll try to get to some of them, but if we don't get to yours, don't worry. I'll convince the ladies here to go back to the event and connect with you and answer your questions. So. Um, We'll, we'll, we'll try to get to as many as possible. I have a question for Kerry that says, what suggestions do you offer for beginning TCI students who are feeling overwhelmed and who need to support students who feel they cannot learn the language? I am grateful for your input and suggestions. Gracias. From Kristen. I think, oh, thank you, Kristen. Um, I think that that's a problem for a lot of students. They have so many classes that they go to where their attitude is that, well, some people just can't do this subject. And they carry that chip on their shoulder a little bit. And so I think that's an important part of the early culture of your classroom is to just establish the fact that you believe that they really can learn a language and um, share with them that they obviously all learn to speak English and that they can learn this second language. And as they go through with you these TCI lessons that are based around vocabulary, that you're keeping comprehensible, they'll build some confidence in themselves. I might also suggest going on the ACTFL website. Um, on the ACTFL website, as a TCI teacher, whether you're targeting your students or whether you're targeting yourself, to find out exactly what levels mm -hmm. look like so that you have confidence mm -hmm. in what the students uh, are looking at. Mm -hmm. um, ACTFL offers videos that show proficiency at all the different levels so that you can you can get confidence that your students are producing where they should be and so that you can also give them confidence that they're producing where they should be. Great. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we have a question for Christy from Brian. And it's cut off a little bit, so I'm going to read the whole question. Christy mentioned having students selecting their own novels. How do you have students reading multiple novels at the same time? I have really struggled to get a novel off the ground with a whole class, so this intrigues me. But unless they are just reading completely on their own, what does this look like in terms of class discussion? 
That's a great question, Brian. Um, I really have only done the self-selecting thing one time. And the way I did it, I did it last year in my Spanish 2 class. And I had students in groups of four or five um, do kind of a reading circle. So um, they had each other for support. Um, we didn't do a lot of discussion during that period. I had a, I, basically what I did is I went online and I looked to see what elementary teachers do in terms of reading circles or literature circles. And I had my students complete those types of discussion activities within their group. And I had them actually videotaping the discussions they were having with each other. Um, it went pretty well. I don't know that I would want to do it that way all the time, but it was kind of a nice change of pace for me. Um, there is a teacher from Colorado, his name is Bryce Hedstrom, and I know he's been having a lot of success with having students self-select novels. So if you search for Bryce Hedstrom, um, he does have a blog and he could probably give you a better answer than I could. Thank you very much. And we have a question from Sierra. How soon would you start a novel in a Spanish 1 class? Who would like to take that? Who, me? Carrie. I yeah, but first I have to say something to you. Was it Brian who said, had the last question? Um, if you're having, here's what I say, if you're having trouble getting started with a novel, spend at least one week. I like to spend two or three, actually. Just spend a week on learning about the places in the novel or topics that have to do with the novel. Spend a lot of time on pre-engagement activities, pre-reading activities, and I bet you the novel will go a lot more smoothly for you. So that's my tidbit. Terry. I, I use Brandon Brown, Quiere un Perro. Brandon Brown wants a dog, which is also available now in Mandarin and in French. And do you have one more, Carol? Um, yeah, it's actually coming out this summer in German. OK. Um, that novel is a very low level. And the kids don't mind at all that it's about eight and nine-year-old Brandon. Um, they think it's a funny story. And it's the perfect novel, because if I pre-teach wants and has and is and goes, they have the basic fundamental vocabulary, there's a ton of cognates, and it's a perfect opportunity to teach novel reading to them because we can work with this really low level novel that's super engaging and they feel like at the end, oh hey, I read a whole novel and it gives them some confidence. Mm -hmm. hey, we so I do that at the end of, end of quarter one. Great. Thank you, Kerry. We have a question for Martina from Kelly. The activity you described are all three steps in one class or over a few days? We have one hour classes. Um, the, with the specific resource that I shared today, I wouldn't have done that all in one day. Usually when I ask a story in class, the story will take about um, a full class period. And so um, I would probably do the story asking to prepare my students for it on one day. And then on the next day, we would do the um, interaction and the investigation. Um, but it all depends on the activities that you choose to introduce um, and interact with. Um, and I'm going to be sharing a whole bunch of them um, at IFLT. And if you go to my blog, um, I have some infographs, too, that have, like, different pairings. So if you know that you only have one class period available and you really want to um, tackle an author, then just choose activities that take less time. But, yeah, for today, it, w it would be longer than one class period. Great. Thank you. And we have a question from Mo. I believe this might be a good question for Carol. Where do you find access to these novels. Also, if funds are short, would you recommend sharing among students? Um, well, I think any of us could, could answer the question. I'll answer first, and feel free to chime in, gals. Um, we have a, a wide variety at um, tprstorytelling.com. And um, you can find all different genres, all different levels, from a unique word count of 100 unique words all the way up to 600 unique words. Um, and if funds are short, these are exactly the novels you should be reading because they're only five bucks a book when you have a classroom set. Uh, a lot of schools will start with just a classroom set and, then, and the books will stay in the classroom. And um, eventually what schools tend to do is they, they tend to expand their library and then eventually try to get books for each student. But for, you know, $125, you can get a classroom set of novels that will last you an entire quarter. I don't know too many publishers that can give you something that's so cost-effective and at the same time so effective for facilitating language acquisition. 
Anyone else wants to answer that question? Any other ideas? OK. <laughs> <laughs> That's OK. Uh, Christy, um, a question from Kristen. Thank you so very much. This is inspiring. Uh, how do you like to implement and start reading with your students? With reading aloud as a group or as individual silent reading? I would definitely say start reading as a group, especially if you're starting out with your, your novice level students. Um, I would say read as little as one or two sentences and then do some discussion, do some circling, um, ask lots of questions about those couple of sentences. Um, just take it in tiny, tiny little baby steps. Um, they probably are not going to be super confident with individual silent reading for a year or so. Um, some kids may be toward the end of level one. Um, I do, I will say that I do have my students doing sustained silent reading, um, usually one to two times a week in level one and level two, um, maybe for five minutes at a time, um, where I just have a library of magazines and children's books and they self-select and they can look at whatever they want. And if they choose to look at a novel during that time, that's fine. <clears throat> Great. Uh, we have a, a lovely comment from Senorita Spadis, I guess. Mm -hmm. Taking so many notes right now, this is a brand new teacher's dream. Ideas, woohoo! Thank you very much for all your enthusiasm. I want to show uh, uh, quickly the IFLT website where you can find more information. We are indeed here in the presence of the top TPRS comprehensible input educators who has given us so much information and ideas. But you can hear more from them at the IFLT conference July 14th to 17th in St. Paul, Minnesota. And it looks like registration is open, isn't it, Carol? Yes, registration is open. And early bird registration ends pretty soon, right, Carol? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Martina. Yes, the early bird pricing ends just in a couple of weeks, the 31st of May. Thank you. Great. So we um, have lots of questions from everyone, and I really appreciate it. This is a great opportunity to interact with these educators. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to twist their arms for a few more minutes. I know their time is valuable. And I'm going to have them interact with you in the Google Plus event page. So don't go away. We're going to end the broadcast here so that they, we all have time to interact a little more outside of this video. And then, uh, please share this uh, video with your friends who have not been able to watch this live broadcast. I'm going to do my best to capture all the links and put them in the description. If we missed something, don't forget to ask. Uh, if, I can, if I don't have the link, I will ask the ladies. So that this is... Even if you cannot attend, unfortunately, the conference, at least you can get a lot of useful information from this live session today. Uh, someone was asking me, how, of, how often do I do this show? Well, as often as I can, uh, I will uh, reiterate my invitation for any educators or performers or creators who are interested in talking about their work and answering questions. This is a great opportunity. Please contact me on any platform, Google+, Facebook, Twitter, and I'll be happy to talk to you how to participate on the EPC show. With that said, I'm going to give, I'm going to want to say a big thanks. Gracias to Carol. Thank you very much. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Paulino. Thank you, Carrie. You're very welcome. Thank you, Paulino. Thank you, Christy. You're welcome. Thanks. And thank you, Martina. Thanks for having us. It was a pleasure to meet you all. And again, don't go away. Keep going in the Google Plus event page if you're live with us. Um, and we'll continue the conversation there. This is the EPC show. And thank you, everyone, for participating today. Have a great week. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.